This is a quiet group. Hey, there he is. Good morning, people. Good afternoon or evening, wherever you might be. Hey there. Is there stillness Thanks. in the land? Hey, don't wake everybody up. <laughs> exactly. It's actually really beautiful right now because we're having a gentle snowfall. Mm. <laughs> Waking you... everything. Judith, so where... I'm in <clears throat> Minnesota. Where... Uh-huh. So Almost... we're getting a gentle snowfall, not the big mass that New York got. Um, it's just going to be a few inches, I think, and only for a few hours this morning, but it just sort of cleans up the whole landscape yeah. and makes it fresh and beautiful. Ken, your, your, your beard almost demands you be outdoors, like maybe with some seal blubber hanging from your belt or something. <laughs> or from my teeth. <laughs> yes. I mean, I wasn't going to go there. A little too graphic for this early. That's all right. No, I'm actually uh, barred from outdoors for a few days. I uh, was out walking the other day and... Uh, missed a step and uh, twisted my ankle pretty good. So oh, um, it's, hence I'm on the couch today with my leg up on, I have a great use for an old yoga bolster. It really works to elevate my leg. Um. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things I learned with the fall a year or so ago is that they've changed the protocol and now they sort of recommend alternating heat and cold or even cold first. 48 hours instead of the first 24. Yeah, with, so, with the sprain, I, I, I came home put it on ice. It's been, it'll be 48 hours this afternoon and I've got it a compression bandage and I've been keeping it elevated and keeping off of it and um, taking Arnica, which um, is really yep. actually a pretty, it's it's as close as to a miracle drug as I'm aware of. Yep. <laughs> yep. It is pretty amazing. Uh, Ken, is that an ankle? It is an ankle. Yeah, I can I can fix it for you. I'll send you something. Okay. It's called it's called compression philosophy, and I've mm. used it on a number of people. And uh, essentially, what the issue is is that the fluid that's in the joint needs the compression of muscles or something else in order to move it back up into the lymph system. Uh huh. Elevation is okay. That's fine. But what if you squeeze? It's uh -huh. a whole different. Like it's much more. Mm. Back thing. Anyway, I'll send you some stuff. It's called it'll compression help you philosophy. Com compression flossing. 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 <clears throat> take take a bicycle inner tube, cut it in half. Now you have a long tube. Slit that. Now you have a long strap. Wrap that around the joint. Flex the joint through the range of motion as you can, and picture yourself squeezing the fluid back into your system, which is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. so you can do it as often as you want to do, and what it'll do is it'll increase the mobility. It'll reduce the pain because a lot of that pain is due to the swelling. Hmm. And it's it's actually the the process by which the healing happens because the, well, the area is flooded with all these chemicals that are trying to heal it. Well, and then the the, fl the, uh, the fluid stays. <laughs> and it, I was like, well, we don't want the fluid there anymore. We want to get the fluid back out. So right. anyway, I'll send you some stuff. At what Thanks, point yeah. do you start? At what point do you start flossing? How, how you do, soon you after can the do it right away. Well, ideally, if you've had it looked at and you know that it's not broken, then you can you can do it as long as you're pain limited. You know, mm -hmm. meaning that that okay, it's just up to you how quickly you want to return to mm -hmm. motion. Then that's mm -hmm. that's cool. acceptable. I had a really good trainer experience at a camp one time. We had a an international counselor visiting with us at the camp and I sprained my ankle pretty badly. And from the UK at that point, their immediate treatment is alternating buckets of hot water and ice water you know, for like 10 minutes of temperature tolerance and then you switch to the other one. And it does some of the same stuff, Scott, in terms of really promoting the movement of fluids in the injury area. But I'm gonna look up compression flossing, that sounds interesting. It's particularly um, important like, at right? the it's particularly important at the end of your leg, at the bottom of your leg, because mechanically, you know, that the lymph there doesn't get back up unless you do something. And and even elevating it just kind of like makes the makes it okay, you know, it doesn't it doesn't you actually want to push it back up. And you want to record these moves so that you can play them in Fortnite as you do the flossing dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whole VR thing. Um, do we want to try to move our chat into Mattermost as much as possible, or should we keep it in the Zoom chat here? I'm good with Mattermost. 
I think there's several of us aren't, aren't on Madame Rosa or aren't aware of it. And Lauren is going to have trouble walking around with a selfie stick and uh, yeah. <laughs> I think for the moment, maybe let's keep ourselves uh, in the usual configuration. So we're using the, the local chat. Um, nice to see everybody. We are, um, we're into February, it's crazy. There's vaccines, the world seems different. Um, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was just talking with, with April this morning that, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't it seem like pandemics usually run two years? Isn't it sort of at least, at least two years? Like if you look at this, the Spanish flu, takes the world down for, for about two years before things walk back to more or less normal. Um, plagues before that are like decades and recur and there's like waves of plague, but, but modern pandemics seem to sort of take us out for a while. But I think we're on the, we're on the back up, uphill climb out of the trough. Yeah. Uh, it's a well, totally different world though than it was in 1918. Yeah. yeah. Jerry, Jerry, why does N equal two give you any predictive confidence? Yeah. N equal two of what? You're just counting two plagues. Oh, I'm generalizing from whatever plagues I've ever heard of. So yeah, but you're generalizing uh, from two, which seems like a small sample. That's true. But um, do you mean that in general, plagues are probably shorter than, I mean, pandemics? I, I, I don't know. So the bubonic plague was a mess. Like the yeah. bubonic plague recurred Decade. over over like more than decades. Like over, over centuries, yeah. Yeah. Recurred. yeah, well, it wasn't continuous, but recurred, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was, was, that, was, was before, that was before the germ theory of disease. I mean, it was a totally different world. Yeah. Today, I will note, we also have the terrain theory of disease, which like is an obstacle in some sense. Everybody know about the difference between the germ theory and the terrain theory? No. So the germ theory is that there's a bug that gives you something, so you need to not get the bug and, and treat the bug. The terrain theory is that if you maintain your body in a healthy state, your terrain is not capable of falling sick. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's sort of, I don't really know, but it sort of seems to dismiss the bugs. No, it's an, it's an, it's an ecological theory. Scott's holding up something. What's that? Your t-shirt says, oh, you're muted. <laughs> it says zombie proof. So oh, that's, this is, this is actually my, my brand that I made a while ago for a hockey team and a training system, but it's that same principle. You build up yourself so that when it happens, you're ready to go rather than trying to recover after whatever event has already happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the same theory you'll see in ecological agriculture, um, you know, which is that the ecosystem always contains a, a wide range of organisms, including pests. The pests are always there, right. uh, but in a healthy ecosystem, they're maintained by other factors, range of soil fertility to beneficial insects. Uh, I think it's important not to treat these as completely antithetical theories, mm -hmm. uh, because even a healthy ecosystem can be deranged by an extreme invasion. Yeah, I think so, it's really yeah. important to remember the people, the First Nations people of Turtle Island. If anybody's read 1491 by Charles C. Mann, uh, those people ate everything was organic. It was all local. They had a variety of foods between 150 to 200 different types of foods. Um, it was for the most part, whatever they didn't preserve was fresh. They were incredibly physically robust. They had really low social stress compared to what we'd have today, low ecological stress. And yet within 10 years of the arrival of the Europeans, 80 to 90% of them were wiped out by novel viruses. So, you know, they had really strong immune systems, but they were not ready for something brand new. And the coronavirus is a novel virus. So, um, you know, it's all well and good to keep yourself really healthy and, and keep your immune system strong. But if something new comes along that's never seen before, it's gonna take a long time for the uh, thing to move through the, the whole body before it gets herd immunity. Two points on that. So we have to add the adaptation theory to the other two. Yeah, but two points on that. The Spanish flu was unusual in that it killed off the young and the healthy first. It, it had a preference for young, healthy people because it turned your immune system against you and flooded you with a cytokine storm. And if you had a really young, healthy immune system, you were actually far more vulnerable. Um, so this doesn't always go the way you think it does. And then the second thing is I highly recommend the book Against the Grain uh, by James Scott. And he goes to Mesopotamia and looks at the earliest cities, Uruk and Ur and all of that. And 
the skeletal remains of the people who were civilized inside the cities uh, have malnutrition, lots of evidence of malnutrition because they were basically eating monocrops. They had, they had been told to go make a lot of grain and they were eating mostly grain diets with a few other things where the marsh Arabs who were basically out in uh, the Tigris and Euphrates area were incredibly healthy and they had all sorts of different variety in their, in their diets. And then all of this then falls under guns, germs, and steel, and the whole idea that if you simply have no immunity to something that's ravaging, you're, however, in some sense, however healthy you are, you're gonna you're gonna fall prey to it. I think, and that's where all my amateur uh, epidemiology fall, you know, ends. Um, cool. So um, why don't we go to a round of check-ins and why don't I check in quickly first, just uh, because last time we ended with, well, what's up with you? Um, and I think it's, a, it's probably a good moment for that because uh, a couple of things. One is we are, I think we're on the cusp of some organizational structure and, and actual financial and legal structure for OGM. Uh, we're, we're testing the waters with a steward ownership model and we're entering conversations around it now. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily the answer, and there are many different people floating all kinds of different answers for what is the structure of the future. But part of the goal of this exercise is to mo is to model and live inside the possible next organizational scheme for how companies should be formed, uh, should be organized, and how we take care of the commons and how we make a living while doing all those things, uh, avoiding some of the the vagaries and dangers uh, and sharks of um, of normal capitalism these days. So it's still a capitalistic thing, but, uh, but I think that'll be interesting. Then a uh, second thing is that uh, Free Jerry's Brain is getting someplace where we're gonna come back into the main group with some, some challenges and some things to do, but also a friend of ours named David Boville came in with a project he has to uh, basically do a combination of kind of um, art and visualization and space and a bunch of other things all heading toward the COP26, which is the next climate um, summit, which is gonna be held in Glasgow in November, uh, but with a stop on Earth Day, which is 12 weeks away. So we're just now kind of uh, sort of signing up where we're busy talking about uh, what does that look like? How do we play? What do we do? Uh, and I think that it's gonna be super interesting to kind of get, uh, um, to get ourselves organized around a thing that has deadlines and times and, and might actually get us some, some exposure and some, some uh, figuring out what, uh, what's going on there. And then uh, Pete has been working on a bunch of uh, Airtable panels for management of where are we, who are we, what are we doing, all that kind of thing. They're not quite, uh, quite ready for all of us to start looking at and using, but they have me real excited because I think one of the things obviously we've been missing is, is a mirror of sorts, a, a techno mirror that lets us see what's up and where is it, where is it, what is its status, uh, what are the next steps, those kinds of things. Um, and Pete, I don't know if you want to uh, talk for a second about that, or we can also we can also defer until we, we sort of bring it into the group. But but that's also cooking, uh, cooking on the burner. Um, I'll I'll defer. Cool. Um, and then, and then last, and just personally, I'm, I'm busy looking for a, an Oregon or Portland-based therapist who understands internal family systems uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's done IFS. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a, a huge fan of family systems therapy that goes back to Virginia Satir and Alice Miller and a bunch of other people, which is usually about the complex dynamics between members of the family. Internal family systems says that there are parts inside of you and that they are all trying to help you and they're often cocking up the works. So um, how do you get them aligned and how do you figure out who those different sub parts of personality parts yeah. are and what's going on? So um, looking around. My wife is a, my wife is a uh, prominent IFS therapist in New York. She's oh, right. a friend of Dick Schwartz and I'm sure she gets you a referral there. Or these days it doesn't really matter where Somebody is, does it? It matters only because I'm covered by Kaiser in Oregon, Washington states, and I think they have to be in territory to be in to be reimbursed in any way. Because uh, in order to afford this, I probably have to do this through Kaiser. Interesting. So, so referrals in the Pacific Northwest would be fabulous. It's worth okay. looking at Talkspace. I think it is, and um, Talkspace? and BetterHelp. Yeah, there's online therapy services now. Oh, um, cool. That it you know it's not zero dollars but 
I don't know. It sounds like a like a massive investment, massive worthwhile investment, Talk massively space, what's, worthwhile. What's the other, <laughs> what's the other uh, one? Talkspace and um, therapy. Uh, better help. Oh, better help. Something like that. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to get out of my own way, um, <laughs> essentially, because you're here. Been, yeah, many of us, I think, I think, do that. Scott, it looked like you had something to to jump in with. So is that like Bo and Family Systems? That's that's the other thing you were talking about. That's the uh, that's the dynamics. And Which other Family Systems? Bowen, B O W E N. I'm not even sure I know Bowen. Um, family Systems to okay. me is an is an umbrella term for fifteen to fifty okay. different now evolved okay. forms of family therapy. I don't know that I know Bowen. I'd have to look him up in my brain. Uh, he's he's the, kind of the founder of it, and then and then uh, okay. Friedman after him. Huh. Okay. Murray Bowen. It's, a long time his, ago. His diagrams. Thank you. Um, yeah, his diagrams have. Uh, he builds them out of triangles, so he has the whole family, and then he, and then there's these triangles of influence, and and he has a nice coding system that's very visual. You know, two lines is a strong, dotted line is a weak. You know that right. kind of stuff. Oh, you do have him in there. So I've got Murray and Bowen theory, but I don't know much about him. He was at Georgetown. Yeah. Uh, genograms is something he did, and then I have it under family systems therapy. And there's yeah. structural family therapy. There's system constellations, uh, internal family systems, uh, and a few other kinds of variants. Mm -hmm. All of that is under types of therapy, and there are uh, plenty. This is A through R. <laughs> yeah, this is A through R. Here's Gestalt, Jungian therapy, intersubjective psychoanalysis, hypnotherapy, human givens. I don't know what that one is. Motivational interviewing, which is really cool uh, and is a path forward right now, et cetera, et cetera. Jerry, can you pop that link into the chat? Uh, you bet. Types of therapy, I'll put that yeah, one in. You can find uh, the other stuff underneath it. And uh, that's my check in. So let, uh, hold on. There we go. Um, so let's go. Um, Lauren, you're on the hoof. Are you going to be indoors soon? I should. Uh, I, I might want to go now just because I, uh, I'm going to get off to go to Colonel. Yeah, That's so on... Charles and I in Colonel. Now, do you mind? Do, should I please, do mine or should I wait? Please, please go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to say hi. And, you know, we do have the... Uh, appreciation bites if you want to use them. I'm not uh, putting pressure on you, but uh, Pete would have to help out with t for today if you wanted to do it. They're the, uh, just like a methodology of sending appreciations to people. And then we can kind of look at them uh, at the end if you wanted to. And yeah, so, uh, 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 Charles and I are in Colonel, and so we've been super busy with that, and um, it just uh, it getting introduced to a lot of kind of movers and shakers and the kind of crypto blockchain community, so that's cool. And uh, I'm also in the process of getting some interns at Kiko Labs, so things should be yeah, it should be it should be great. I'm super excited about that. That's it. It's nice to see everyone. That sounds awesome. Thank you. I put a link to the appreciation bites in the chat. Um, it, it is a way to appreciate things that other people in our groups are doing. Um, can someone check to see whether this meeting, the standing Thursday call is in there as an event or, and if not to put it in so that we can pick from it. Um, you'll see what that means if you go in and try to do it because you get to pick a, a person in the, in, the, in the group. And then uh, Lauren has created a really, really lovely set of attributes of uh, the kinds of appreciations one, one might offer. And then there's also a notes field after that where you can type in freeform text that says why, what, whatever. Uh, and there's also a form where you can see the results of the appreciations, which I will put in the chat right now. This is for the, the results so you can see what, a, what the finished appreciations start looking like. Um, so then let's go uh, Mark Julian Ingrid. And Mark is hunting for his unmute button. Oh, we go. Uh, hi, all. Uh, it's my first uh, video here. Um, so uh, 
Actually, one theme I've, I've, I've been working on is uh, how to relate uh, movements or organizations to actual power. And th this was, uh, those of you who've read uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, uh, maybe might be aware of how uh, he faces some difficult issues, uh, you know, including some, uh, uh, you know, violent means of overthrowing power, which will not voluntarily do so. Uh, however, I found a very interesting connection in Canadian context, which is that th there's a uh, governmental position called the Governor General, which represents the Queen, and actually the Queen of Canada, which happens to have the same human body as the Queen of England. Um, but I think there's a way to reframe that. Uh, and, and the basic logic is very simple. It's based on the ancient saying that King and Queen sorry, king, the king and the land are one, or you could say the queen and the land are one. So uh, basically the governor general ultimately really represents the land. And uh, so I think in a Canadian context, there's at least in theory a possible way for a seven generational view uh, supported by something like a ministry for the future to actually be tied into power. So that's actually what I'm exploring. And uh, I think there are possibilities for this in Commonwealth countries in the UK, uh, not in the US because that's a different system, but uh, that's, that's, I think that that's one uh, particular project I'm on. So that's what I'm doing. Love that, thank you. Um, Kevin has to boogie pretty shortly. So let's jump to Kevin next and then Julian and Ingrid. Uh, you're muted still. I'm on a laptop and it's not cool. a touch screen. I keep forgetting. I put my finger over there. Anyway, um, yeah, I've been working on this community equity fund, uh, friends and family funding for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle. And we've kind of gotten our, our act together and, and are uh, going to be on about three different event platforms and then spend about an hour and a half with the team today. Uh, segmenting our outreach to thought leaders on three segments. Uh, you know, one is the top level, David Brooks, uh, Charles Blow, kind of mass level. Then there's the folks who are looking and writing about a, a good new economy. And then there are the folks at the institutes who have an agenda for that. And so we figured out our outreach around that. So it's just, a, you know, turning the concept into a, into a, uh, an influence machine in, in a way. And it's, it's, it's kind of fun to, to do it. Um, I've done it enough times that we've actually sort of systematized the instinct. And so that's kind of interesting. So anyway, that's all moving forward. That sounds awesome. And I love hearing your progress. Thanks. Um, very cool, thank you. Uh, let's go Julian Ingrid Vincent. So my status, it's related to a quick story about Xerox Park where I did an internship years ago. And at Park, the only requirement they had from the scientists that was that every six months they do a status report. Otherwise, they were free to do what they want. And actually, Park in that incarnation was the closest thing to a group mind I've ever come across. But with regards to these status reports, one of the scientists was working on a way to automate the status reports. But that was a valid research project, so it passed the administration. So in that vein, my current hot topic is trying to trim down on Zooms. Last week and this week have been spent almost entirely in Zooms and I haven't gotten any work done. So I'm right now focused on how to try, on how to trim that down so I can get back to work. I think Zoom means idleness in Swahili. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, uh, Ingrid Mark Vincent. I'm sorry, Mark already went. Uh, Ingrid Vincent Bentley. I'm going to pass this week, guys. Thanks. Sounds great, thank you. Uh, Vincent Bentley Klaus. So um, I have two things. One, I'm posting a link to a really cool um, article that I just read by the uh, Rockwell Foundation about systems um, innovation. And it was very intriguing because I felt crazy for a while in trying to like focus on too much. And then people are saying like, oh, just pick one thing and focus on it and do it well. And uh, there's just one line from it, it says systems are, product are productive precisely because they are more than standalone products. A system pulls together all the different ingredients to meet a need. 
Um, and it was talking about how like you can't have a contactless payment uh, like kiosk without a credit card and you can't have in like a shipping container without the ship and the containers. And so like all these things work together in a system. Um, and so that was really, it's a really interesting read. It has some really cool visuals too. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was just share the calendar real quick and then take any questions about it so we can kind of like uh, clean it up before, um, before it starts getting like super used. So let me just share my screen. Sounds awesome. So I posted the link in the chat to the document, which is where uh, we'll be throwing all of the different links. Um, so the first one is a link to a form. So if there's any event that is like related um, that you like, like an event that you would post in the form or send out to the email list, you can also just throw it on the calendar there. and see like, okay, there's this cool there's conference, conference happening that I think people should know about. And you could put the start time, how long it is. A uh, URL to the event. If you don't put a URL to the event, it's going to automatically generate a Google Meets link. And so if that's not the actual link or like you don't have the link yet, just like that's just one thing that it, it'll automatically generate uh, a Meets link. So just be wary of that. And then you can put the event type. If it's of general interest, that's like any event that you kind of just want to like share with people. But then we also have like, is it an OGM or Kiko Lab internal or public? And we can add more types. So if you have any suggestions for types. Um, and then if you hit draft, it won't send it to the calendar right away. And if you hit schedule it, it'll immediately send it to the calendar. Um, and you could put weekly or monthly reoccurring or a one-time event. And if it's reoccurring for now, we're just going to manually duplicate it a bunch of times until we uh, make a system that does that automatically. It's not too hard. Um, and then just put your email in case we have any like questions or need to like change anything. We could like, you know, know who submitted the event. Then any questions here? And I'm going to show what happens after you submit it. So once you submit an event, it first goes to the Airtable, and this gives us like a spreadsheet of all the events, which can then be exported in a bunch of different formats. Um, this could be the sent out as like a CSV, an iCal if you wanted it, um, and we have the event link. So if you put a link, it's going to go here. If not, this is going to take you, so this takes like you to the Collected Next Zoom for the OGM call, and for other things, it takes you to a Google Meets link. Um, and you could also like filter and sort these um, if it got that there was like a hundred events. Um, and there's also a gallery view with an event link and it tells you what organization. And then there's the Google calendar, which um, all of these three links can be embedded on any websites. So um, on the new OGM site, this can be embedded on the site or we can like filter down the air table to show only the public events and then put that view on the website. So if anyone needs an embed link to embed it on a website, let me know and I'll make a custom one. And, uh, and then all the events are on this Google calendar. And if you hit the plus in the bottom, then you'll subscribe to that calendar. And so you'll have it as like a, um, a little checkbox in your Google calendar where you can check on and off and then see all the events. So I have the, um, are the times presumed to be the user's time or are you going to put in a time zone display? So when you add an event, add it in your local time, it automatically will then convert it to UTC. Mm. And then when you subscribe to the calendar, it'll show it in your local time. If we embed this on the OGM site and it's a public calendar that's visible, we, it creates a problem by making the Zoom link visible and we're op opening up risk of Zoom bombing. Um, mm. Yeah, and so I love the idea and I want to embed this. I'm trying to figure out how do we keep the Zoom, the actual Zoom links a little uh, tucked away a little bit more from public view. So Just would we thought. want to have, would we want to have uh, like, 
I guess would we want, what would be the ideal scenario? Would we want people to see the event, but then have to like request the link or something like that? Ideally, you see that you see all the events and you can only access the link if you're a member of OGM or if you're, and I, and I can give you access to the OGM Google group, which I use as an access control list, mm. right? So if you're on that list, then you're good to go kind of thing. That would work, I think. And it may be more cumbersome yeah, to try to do. Syncing, but, but, <clears throat> syncing up with that, that, the Google group is, is work. It's a lot of work. Um, mm. But Vincent, I think a, a way to do it would be to put Zoom links in a separate column and then have a password protected page or something like that where there's a view that shows the Zoom links. Yeah, I, could, I can think of a few workarounds. I think it would be helpful to just understand what would be the best case scenario of, uh, so like obviously, is the OGM site or going to have a part of it that's only for OGM? Like, because there could be also a page on the OGM site with a password that then has the calendar that with all the links. That's true. Um, that may be that may be the simplest workaround for the for the time being, um, possibly. Although passwording the OGM site implies rebuilding the and putting the OGM site probably somewhere else as well. Um, we'll figure this out. I, I I didn't mean to get us stuck on a on a coding issue, but. Um, but I love that I love that you've got the calendar like humming. Thank you, Vincent. That's awesome. Yeah, it was also help from uh, yes, Lauren just said uh, yeah, it was uh, Pete, um, Pete, Safan, Charles, um, and there was one other person on our call helping us with the calendar, uh, and Eric um, all helps with the calendar. Cool. Thank you. Um, Let's go, uh, Klaus, uh, Bentley, Hank. Sorry. Yeah, I think I'm going <clears> to <throat> turn my video off because I'm still on mobile here. Uh, this has been a really interesting week because with the new administration coming in, particularly with uh, Vilsack, the uh, incoming Secretary of Agriculture, um, for the NGOs, uh, this, this consortium of NGOs that we are, uh, have formed around regenerative agriculture, um, typically for you know, years, they have been fighting against, they have been fighting against uh, a government that has taken really unreasonable steps that they are violating the commons. And so they, they, it was a fight, we are against this bill, we are against that bill. Um, and now all of a sudden you have an administration coming in that is in fact soliciting input and that is soliciting uh, listening to uh, where should we go. And it's really has created- Crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it has created a moment of disorientation, actually. You know, so, <laughs> um, so I'm 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 advocating is let's switch from transition from against to for what are we for? You know, and articulate uh, this particularly. And what what you realize is that government has made decisions that are actually vi violating basic science. And that's true for you just think of climate change. But one really egregious example in the food world is the, the nutritional guidelines that were published in 2020, where they um, the mandatory had a science uh, advisory panel and then promptly went against the explicit uh, and written recommendations of their science advisory council publishing uh, guidelines that were again, uh, violating basic knowledge about nutrition and the impact of nutrition on health and so on. So it's, it's, it really is a, a moment in time that requires some thought on how to, for, for NGOs on how to engage uh, with government in a more a rational science focused uh, uh, conversation. And it also brings a lot of things into focus when you think about artificial intelligence evolving and what could it do and should it do? I mean, basically, if there was a way to find a uh, science-based argumentation where best available science is 
um, actually used as a foundation for decision making, um, that would be uh, a very necessary and, and also um, monumental shift in, in developing policy. Um, the question, of course, is what constitutes best available science and who gets to say what it is. Uh, so so th th this is sort of the struggle that, that is happening uh, right now in, in my world. So we have spirited debates. Um, the other thing is that we are shifting focus now to uh, support rural development. And we are doing this by showing films, documentaries that have been developed. I'm, I'm going to post one in a moment. Um, that by, by local people uh, talking about how uh, they succeeded in developing their community, very rural, very uh, remote, uh, small communities. Um, and where really the, the heartaches are so profound and where the political uh, uh, base is also um, um, very right-wing and very, very aggressive and very, very wounded really. Um, so, so we're we're looking to to stimulate conversations, and we have been uh, doing this. In fact, we we have two of these running this week um, with with commu at community level, and they attract two three hundred people to to listen in. Um, that that sort of encourage a focus away from politics and on very practical immediate steps that you can take to build local community. That's sort of what's happening in my world. Um, it's just kind of exciting to hear you describe that, Klaus, because you have your feet in the ground in a really important sector. We've heard you for a long time working really hard on the sector, and all of a sudden we have an administration that's, that's eager for input, whatever that means, and it opens up a bunch of actually much more interesting, more productive questions, and my heart is just like, yes. I'm, I'm happy, happy to hear your check-in and want to see how OGM can be helpful to uh, figure out what does the science-based policy look like and how do we, how, and, and you also included um, empathy for people who feel now marginalized and left out and, and sort of uh, uh, prob probably frightened about what's going on, which is sort of the, the losing side of the last election and how to reach out to them and how to, how to do this inclusively. So all those things are really um, just delightful to me and I wanna figure out how, how do we marshal ourselves. So thank you for that, Klaus. Uh, Bentley, Hank, and Scott. So uh, that's probably the perfect tee up. I was gonna mention uh, that I hired a marketing firm to kind of help me get a project out and start um, getting some feedback on it. So it's a project I may have mentioned before called GoaliBot, and its express purpose is to um, help people come to rational group decisions, kind of build agreement. And it does that by having people kind of put forth their evidence and uh, weigh the evidence um, uh, in, a, in a shared mathematical model. Um, and then it kind of forces you to think through why you believe what you believe and then... Um, display it. So it, it's built to address those specific issues. Um, so Klaus, if, if you have any debates that someone might have some time to put through the and stress test the system, um, that would be helpful. Um, and then anyone else that's interested in uh, either learning more or amplifying this experiment would be appreciated. Can you explain just a little bit more um, what Gullybot does, what the, co what the conversation is like with this bot? Because I think that the more people understand how it works, the easier we'll be able to find places where you can test it. Yeah, yeah, I'm still struggling a bit with the explanation, but um, right now, uh, Gully is analyzing, um, uh, should we, should as an individual kind of take the, um, uh, take the vaccine for COVID, right? So there's a lot of people concerned about that. Um, so he, uh, or it's not really he, it's Annette. It, uh, we kind of feed it with uh, some of the major pros and cons and it uses math and looks at it the way a naive 
child would probably look at a situation and say, okay, you have these two pros, these two cons, uh, and if they're all equal weight, then they weight, then they equal each other out. And then people are invited to add information to this naive gullible robot. And uh, um, as they do that, then they're kind of forced to think about, well, why would I convince this five-year-old <laughs> that they should take the vaccine? Um, and, and so you, you put in evidence into the system and then there's a way to counteract evidence saying that's bad evidence or it doesn't relate um, by putting in more evidence. Um, and then it just uses math to add that up where we use uh, heuristics to add that up in our brain, but it's doing explicitly and shows the numbers. So you can see this fact um, adds to the top uh, result where Gullibot believes or doesn't believe in this claim uh, based on this evidence, then you have an opportunity to go in and add more evidence on why it shouldn't. So it, it, it um, encourages people to ex be explicit about why they think something is true or isn't true. So it's and, a sort uh, of ra rationality uh, processor. Yeah, yeah. And it does it on Twitter, so it's completely open. And <laughs> wow. Now, right, right now, it's completely manual, except for the math bit. It does the calculations, but someone's going to have to be behind Gullibot and always be polite. So everyone who gets something in, he'll say, oh, thank you for that fact. And that's the thing, is gullible. You can say whatever you want. Uh, it's up to other people to come back and, and say why that's wrong. If people start saying nonsensical stuff to it, I'm just going to say, oh, error, I, I didn't understand. Please rephrase, repeat that. And, and my question to you was going to be gully means gullible, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's really interesting to hold an innocent gullible artifact in the middle of the conversational space. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it helps to shift people's attention because then it's not a confrontation with someone else who might shame you or embarrass you or whatever. And in fact, if they're just sort of gullible, then whatever, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like phoning into uh, QVC or something like that. Uh, you know, but the person who takes your call on the other end and is trying to sell you the cubic zirconium, their job is to make you sound as fun and cool as possible. They are clearly not going to undermine you in any way at all. This is the best right. 15 minutes of fame you're ever going to get. <laughs> Right. So it's kind of a safe interaction. And I like that a lot. Yeah. So it's kind of, he's got, it kind of bypasses some of the emotional triggers and helps people kind of focus in on the rational side. It makes it more playful and less confrontation or Love less that. divisive. Thank you. Uh, Julian. So <clears throat> I guess being cynical here, we came right from uh, Klaus's check-in where he talked about the starting turnabout of having an administration that's science-based and actually listens to people. And I'm thinking that we have evidence from the last four years that people don't make decisions based on rationality. So if you have something that's processing something for rationality, uh, what's gonna be different about getting it to work? Well, uh, people do make this, some decisions rationally and they make other decisions not because of the level of effort. So if we can bring down the level of effort to make a rational decision, then more decisions hopefully would be rational. That's the hypothesis. So, you know, nothing's a cure for everything, but if, if we can make it easier, then it might increase the agreement and the rationality. That's the theory. Um, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, people, I, and I just typed them in the chat, people tell bots stuff they won't tell other humans. Like with, with uh, Eliza and some of the very earliest completely crude conversational systems, um, the researchers were shocked to discover that they were hugely popular, like people really started, started to engage and talk with them, and that, that people were sort of much more confessional with these devices than, than normal. So there, there might be openings to ask difficult questions that people can, can think about on their own time, in their own space, in their own way. But if Gullibot can lead towards some open-ended questions that are very difficult to process with conversational AI, like, like you're, you're, you're quickly out of your depth in, in the ability to respond automatically, but you could be actually opening up tremendous thinking and being space for people who are engaging with it. That might be interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's very interesting. Um, because I love, I love chatbots because they're tireless, they're inexpensive, you can keep making them better, uh, and they have all these funny attributes. They're kind of like a person, but kind of not. Right. Yeah. And they'll take it's a little bit like people who have children with autism discovering that uh, Alexa and Google Assistant and all those things are actually really, really, really good companions because they're tireless. They don't mind repetition. 
uh, you know, all, all those kinds of things, right? Uh, and, and how to hack that uh, for, for good, I think is interesting. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Bentley, cool stuff. Uh, Hank, Scott, Linda. Yeah, so um, I, I think my check-in will be quick. I think I've just been thinking a lot about, um, I mean, some of the comments that I made last last week, which were just about, um, oh, you know, people kind of taking mental shortcuts in a lot of ways and um, becoming kind of mechanical and the things that they say and the ways that they <clears throat> they act and <clears throat> following the crowd. And I have just been really reflecting on um, my efforts to actually like engage in really difficult discussions that actually lead to some kind of uh, at least the, the start to coming up with some, you know, kind of fixes to some of these, these big issues that we brought up on this call and, and that just kind of like occur in life. Right. Um, and I just have kind of noticed that, um, you know, a lot of my friends and, and me too, you know, use a lot of <clears throat> just kind of like tags, right. Like the black lives matter, defund the police, et cetera, et cetera. And we say these things and make a lot of these like implicit assumptions in our heads that they're talk that they're talking about the same thing that I'm talking about because we're both kind of speaking the same language, but there's this hesitancy to actually dig deep into explaining like, oh, what do I actually mean by that? What do you actually mean by that? Like, what are the real issues that we see here? So we can, we can kind of start reading, reaching some kind of, you know, convergence and, um, uh, you know, not really like gunning for right or wrong answers, just really uncovering, like, what are we actually trying to say with these, you know, monikers? Um, and I think I've just been really surprised at the hesitancy for people to actually like engage really deeply. Um, in, in those conversations, because they're tough, right? Like, uh, you know, some, some of them can be offensive and you like don't want to find out that your friend thinks something that <laughs> um, different than you sometimes. Uh, but it, it's just been, it's, it's been a, a challenge for me too. Um, and uh, so that's really been, been where, my, where my head's at this week. And again, just like, I, one of the reasons why I love this space is I feel like I could call any of you guys and have those tough conversations, partially because we probably just never met in person. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but anyway, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of where I've been at. So. Yeah. Thank you. Are you mostly dealing with people, you know, or would be in, in repeated contact with, or are you trying strangers too? Um, I would say more people that I'm in closer contact with because it's easier for me to just kind of be like, Hey, can we like, it's easier for me to get their time. Right. Um, I've tried some strangers, strangers and have had previous conversations with strangers which had kind of like there's there's a level of like fearlessness that comes with talking to somebody that you don't know where you're like hey well like I have nothing to lose by just being myself and saying what I think right um but you know given the environment outside some you know sometimes uh it's harder to just have random conversations but anyway sorry Jerry oh don't be sorry at all um there's a guy I back on Patreon, he has a, a, a show he calls like Let's Chat. <laughs> He's a rhetorician and he goes and he sets up a card table outside of a flea market or a church or whatever else uh, in I think relatively conservative towns. And he basically puts up a sign and he has nice video cameras and nice microphones and he'll interview people. Um, but he's always doing strangers. And, it's, and uh, it, what's interesting is that you may be, it may be easier for you to book the appointment to have the conversation, but having the conversation may open up this whole relationship risk thing that they may be unwilling to, to, to unpack because if they told you what they really thought, they might lose you as a friend or something or right. something else, right? Or they might be ashamed of what they think, even though they think it, who knows what, like there's a thousand things in there that are, that are interesting and powerful. Put that in the chat. Uh, which one? The let's chat I just put in the, in the chat. Oh, good. Thank yep. There's you. a there's a brain link to Let's Chat in My Brain where you'll see the YouTube channel he's got. Uh, very interesting guy named Ty Wells, Tyrone Wells. Thank you. Um, cool. Let's go, uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, thank you, Scott. Linda Pete. Okay, um, Klaus. Thank you for that discussion of of science. I'm going to paraphrase this. So I, what I heard was science as a current set of best available information, something along those lines. 
And I think one of the challenges we're having is that we're thinking of people who aren't thinking of science or maybe others like that are, are in the space of science as a, as a set immutable fact that is. This is a thing, I learn it once and that's what it is. And we all know exactly what that is. And I think the more you look into it, the more you realize that's what we know right now. And then next week we might, we might adjust that a little bit based on new information. And then what we're adding to it is science-based, but it's not, it's, it's adding to and changing and updating. And it's a living thing as opposed to a, a set piece. And I think that's kind of a, it's an important point that I'm not sure that, that, that we all grasp in the sense of, you know, why don't they know what we should do? Well, because it's evolving. So anyway, I thank you for that, that inspiration that has given me some things to think about. Second thing of three. Um, so rational, I just did a quick look up of words because I love my words. Rational, based on or in accordance with reason or logic. Okay, so here we have a rational decision. Rationale, let's put a little E on the end of it. Now it's a set of reasons or logical basis for a course of action or a particular belief. So now what's happened is we have a set of reasons for a belief as opposed to if you're thinking logically, if you're making a rational decision that is antithetical to a rationale for your decision. And I think that that's, that's important because the people who are making the decisions do not think they're thinking illogically or irrationally. They are thinking they have a rationale for what they are, what they're thinking. And I think that's important to, to understand where the, the set of reasons, because there is a reason. It's not just they pulled it out of the air, there's a reason. So the third thing, it's a question for all of you. It's something that I've been working on with my thinking skills program. So the word T-A-O, Tao, what does that mean to you? Does that mean, does that spark philosophy or does that spark religion? And I'd, I'd like a, a way of thinking or a, or a doctrine. And I just like a show of fingers. So. Dao, does that mean way of thinking philosophy? How many, how many hands up for that? Okay, and how many people think that that's, that sounds like Taoism, that's actually like a, a religion or a, or a doctrine? It's also a religion or a doctrine. I mean, Taoism is based on okay. the Tao. What I was trying to see was in my agnostic set of thinking tools, if that word, to indicate the balance between the new and the known is, is has, has connotations that come with it that I don't, I don't want to bring. Because it's such a wonderful word to capture that, that thought. Um, you know, the word I've been using before was balance. And I'm just wondering if Tao actually makes, makes more sense. And overall, I saw more philosophy by a long shot. So that kind of helps me. I'm just not sure. But that was the only question that I had. I will keep thinking about it. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, I think for me, Dao raises complex issues pretty quickly. It's a profound and lovely word. And, I, and I'm not sure that six people would interpret it in, in, in two ways. I think they might interpret it in six ways. So it might be very complicated to include. So, so I'm thinking that I have the, the Tao philosophy is built into this one set of three thinking tools as part of my structure. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I need to use that word because I think the word brings with the things that I don't necessarily want to have. It can have the philosophy built into it. If you understand what that is, fine, but you don't have to, to, to understand the balance between the new and the known. Okay. Mm -hmm. That helps me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda, Pete, Doug. And you're muted. You're somehow muted. Linda, you're muted on both devices. I think one of them is your phone and it's and your phone is muted. And the other one is your uh, Zoom on your laptop. And that one is actually muted through Zoom.
and one of them will liberate you in a moment. <laughs> And I love that you have redundant systems going here. Um, I think she said pass in the comments. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, well, as soon as you figure out uh, to get to get your voice back in, you're welcome to test it, and we'll come back to you. Um, let, for right now, let's go, Pete, Doug, George. Um, so, what did John Gall say? Uh, redundant systems fail redundantly, something like that. Something like that. Um, uh, <clears throat> good morning, all. Um, this has been a, a fruitful and productive week uh, in the kind of sense making about what OGM is for me. Uh, lots of productive conversations, uh, lots of interesting thinking and uh, and stuff. Um, and I apologize for not having a way to encapsulate that better than than what I just said. Actually, I did have a little show and tell, and this is actually kind of cruel for me to do. I think. Um, but I, I, in conversation with somebody, I drew a, an ugly picture. And so this, I, I carry this as a little token of, I actually did stuff this week. Um, this was also the week that uh, uh, OGM and Federation, Kiko Lab and Metacogs and things like that took enough of my week that, uh, in, and that I, I actually blew off a couple days of, of real work, paying work. Um, and and had to tell uh, one of my primary clients, you know, I'm I'm sorry. Look, these there's a couple of days in my week that aren't aren't available to you anymore um, because I'm off on this uh, this new exciting, uh, grand and wonderful adventure, which I think is going to start to balance the uh, uh, income maybe someday. I can see a path forward for that, or actually I can't see a path forward. I can see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, a uh, couple things top of mind. Uh, actually, Scott Scott talking about science and the way people think about it. I, I'm going to put this in the chat instead of going talking through it uh, in the in the uh, interest of time. So I'll skip that one, put it in chat. Um, uh, this week, uh, the Flotilla Project, Flotilla Group, uh, which is uh, interested, is a guild slash pod project working on. Um, directories and matchmaking. It's me and Vincent and a few other folks. Uh, we're going to have our first kind of open, you know, open office hours working session thing uh, tomorrow um, uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon uh, Eastern, uh, 1800 CET. Um, you're welcome to join. I, I, we've, well, I won't say more. Um, uh, there's a Mattermost group also, Tools for Connectors, if you want to kind of chat whether or not it's even worth you coming to Flotilla. Uh, but we're, we're pushing hard on having directories of people and directories of projects within OGM, Kiko Lab, things like that. Kind of like the shared calendar, but um, for people and projects. Um, another thing that's alive for me this, this yesterday and this morning uh, is something that ended up getting called e Emergent Events Sensemaking. Um, uh, Stefan Kreutzer on Mattermost actually in in what I thought was a wonderful way of Mattermost actually working for us um, mentioned something in the off topic uh, channel. He said, yo, I'd like to, I'm, I'm going to say it in, in Californiaese instead of uh, Stefan's more erudite uh, uh, language. Um, yo, it'd be fun to talk about this GameStop short squeeze thing and, and try to do some sense making about it. Um, and back and forth with me and him and a few other people, um, it, it ended up being that we could kind of conceive of, you know, there's these big hairy situations, the 2008 stock crash or 9-11 or, um, or COVID-19 responses. Um, where there's a lot of inf like too much information and it's all very complicated and wound together. And, and now in this day and age, uh, it's also true that you've got um, various actors pushing really hard on the information space to distort it and warp it and things like that. So um, it feels like it's a small effort at this point, um, uh, but just just taking the, the next step to say, hey, why don't we actually like think about this and do this and, and do it as a thing and draw diagrams or make um, flow models or things like that. Um, so uh, I, I called it, uh, this. all the details of this are on the list and actually also on the forum. 
um, and there's a new channel on Mattermost. Um, not to overwhelm anybody, you don't need to find all of those. You just need to find one of them, and it will, it will point you in the right place. Um, uh, but it, there's two things for me. One of them, the topic itself is very interesting. Um, and it was also something that bubbled out of the milieu of OGM and, and the associated things around it. it. It came out of the network, this idea that this would be a thing that you could actually do and it would be valuable and useful. I also want to shout out to Ken. Um, Ken's uh, question on the list, um, you know, yo Pete, this is awesome. Thank you for posting this Twitter thread and I, I actually can't read it because it's, you know, all like jumbles of words. If there were a picture of that, then I could actually, you know, tell what the heck was going on. So that was that was the, the impetus for me to meet uh, Stefan's, you know, other, he's, he's got a personal interest and he's done a, a ton of research and digging into, um, digging into the various information streams that he can find. And some of them, he went pretty deep and in, and in interesting places. Um, but anyway, it's like, there's, there's a thing there and it was cool that this emerged, this effort could emerge out of the thing that we're doing with OGM. And it, it surprised me because it was like, you know, three days ago, I didn't really even think that this was a, a, a practice that, or a community of practice that somebody would join up in. And now a couple of days later, it's like, yeah, this is actually a really good emerging practice. Um, I can even see this would be an amazing consulting uh, team. You know, we've got, we've, we're starting to get the, you know, the practice and, and tools and things like that for like a big financial company, you know, they could ask somebody like us, you know, hey, what's this thing all about and how do we make sense of it? And I can actually see us putting together the, the operating system for that kind of thing. So I was super excited. Um, uh, so again, Flotilla Friday, uh, I'll, I'll put some links um, for that and other stuff in the shop. Um, Pete, thank you. And I just tripped across Stefan's comments about the emergent event sense making this morning. Uh, before uh, before getting on this call, so I'm eager for that. And part of I think what he said was, "Man, we're 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 OGM. We should be sitting here like visualizing this and really diving deep in, and offering the world a great visualization of things like the GameStop short squeeze." Um, and and I didn't even have a chance to answer. A piece of my answer was, "You're completely correct." And I'm sitting here mapping it. And I, I put a link to my brain for it. You know here. I'm mapping it in my own tool, in my own way, and not even having that conversation publicly other than if somebody stumbles across it. I would love to have ways in which many of us curate this thing in public view. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, an, o, an OGM practice that would get us attention, that would be completely fulfilling to those of us who are obsessive about tracking stuff, mapping stuff, linking stuff, uh, you know, turning the soil on all these things, and it could be useful to a whole bunch of other projects uh, whether it's education or debate or in discourse or whatever else. So I'm, so you're right. There's, there's something very, very um, juicy and nutritious, like in the middle there that's forming up. I, I want to mention real quick. Also, one of the, the tools, as I've been thinking, as, as I've been thinking about Ken's question, actually, um, there's a, a fairly old discipline and set of, set of computer tools um, for systems, dynamic, dynamic, dynamic systems modeling. Um, basically, you can set up stocks and flows and have a, a view of a system. You know, uh, uh, if you kill off the, uh, the sea anemones, then, you know, this affects other. So you can draw system diagrams in lots of different ways. The story I have for this is actually literally back in the 90s, I think, um, I was talking to a, a practitioner uh, that used an old tool, probably Stella or I think. Um, and, um, and they were trying to, to a set of consultants were trying to explain to the board of and the and the CEO of Ford Motor Company um, what was going on in the world that impacted their you know their thing and what happened in the conversation was each board member had their own view of the world and they were all yelling at each other and fighting and nobody you know and the CEO couldn't couldn't tell heads from tails right so the uh, systems dynamic modeler came in and said okay tell me a little bit about you know, um, your, uh, your, uh, the providers of, you know, the, the, the people, where, where, where are your stocks and flows, right? Um, who are your suppliers? Uh, who are your sinks? You know, what, uh, how do, how are they all connected? And so over the course of a day or two, they, they modeled this in a way that then um, the whole team could 
go onto this, you know, dorky little computer 1990s screen and fiddle with buttons, right? And you can just see, oh, if we fiddle with the buttons, all the ways that we were thinking of fiddling with the buttons, you know, make end up making us starve to death, you know? So the, the one or two people who had a, a, the right way of kind of thinking about it could finally explain to other people, here's how this system works. And here's why we wouldn't, you know, market things this way, or here's what, how we have to invest in our suppliers better or things like that. And so, and then magically the CEO was, and, and the rest of the team was able to see the, the right thing to do and, and, and went on to do it. So that's the story I have for a system dynamics modeling. There's a new, uh, a new web-based thing called Insight Maker that I'm excited to try out. Um, and I want to thank Mark Antoine for finding it for me. Um, also, uh, Bucky Fuller ran something in 1961 called the World Game uh, that was then run again later when we actually had personal computers and a whole bunch of other stuff. And a friend of, a friend of mine, a friend of multi, several of ours, Dwayne Hendricks, was at both of these events. Um, and these events are really cool because they're about um, experimenting with data, they're about conversations in a room, they're about negotiations, a whole bunch of things happen in these, in these games. But I think it, much like uh, Vannevar Bush or Doug Engelbart's visions or Ted Nelson, these are, these are inspiring visions to a lot of people who are busy inventing how we might do this in the future. So imagine the things we're talking about here being part of an ongoing world game that people could participate in, they could spawn, and fork and do themselves in their in their neighborhoods, whatever it might be, or it could be the neighborhood game, or I don't know. But but I think all of these things are now much more feasible than they were when they were first prototyped, when they were first tested. Um, yeah, exactly. Thanks, Gil. So uh, Linda, if you'd like to jump in, I'd love to just uh, have you jump in a bit since you seem to have conquered the the audio thing. Uh, and although I'm not hearing, there we go. There you are. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, this has been um, very pertinent for me, a, a lot of the topics today about nutrition and the frequent changes in nutritional science. And it's not small course corrections. It's like one day they'll say one thing and then you, years down the road, they'll say the opposite. It's not a, a small correction. Salt, so wine, animal fats. People, pardon me? Yeah. Salt, wine, animal fats. Yeah. Exactly. And that gives a lot of people, um, they start discounting science because they see these reversals. Uh, people who don't really have much understanding of how science works. And so, yeah, that's one thing that happens. Another thing um, that I see <laughs> that I've seen happen about 20 something years ago, I got involved building a co-housing community. It was like 12 middle-class people who built a four and a half million dollar project. We were always about to lose the project for years on end. There were so many difficulties permitting and we pulled it off and I lived there for 20 years or so. But uh, decisions are made by groups of people with anything but rationality. I mean, that's the way it works in the model. That is not the way it works in practice. And so um, systems, like the way this group works, it's very interesting to me. You're a, a magnificent facilitator, by the way, Jerry. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. <laughs> you do. Um, but yeah, that's just what I bring to this, is that real world experience with a group of everyone who's so idealistic and tries so hard, but you have virtue signaling, you have people who's all with great values, but their highest value is different and often conflicting. Um, so there you go. Thank you everybody for letting oh. me listen to your, um, to your activities and all. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and some comments a little bit earlier made me realize that when very conservative or religious people are coming in and listening to conversations about how science should run things, they may well be interpreting things as commandments or as truths from a religious sense and as immutable, when in fact a healthy scientific mind is pretty flexible and permeable, this doesn't always actually play out this way in science, but still the goal is that scientific method is moving toward, and, and, and as new realities show up, and sometimes this takes a generation to, to wash through, but, but we, science is meant to evolve, is meant to be sort of toward a moving, a moving target of explaining the world better and figuring things out. And how to crack that aspect of the conversation seems important to me. Um, because I think that the, I hadn't realized that a lot of people who are rejecting science may well be rejecting it because they see it as coming in with alternative truths when in fact what it's coming in with is a process, right? And how, how to make that 
clear and present. I don't, I don't really know. Um, let's go Doug George Kim. Yeah, OK, um, I want to talk about uh, how you got a group to deal uh, with uncomfortable basic assumptions that they don't want to question. So my, I've got two examples. The first is I deal with a group of economists. And they default to the view that growth is absolutely essential, unquestioned. And the problem with growth is that in the economy that we have, all the fruits of it go to the rich. It's not distributed. And that actually makes the disparity worse. Another thing about growth is all growth uses energy. You can't avoid it. And more energy put into the environment tends to contribute to global warming. So there's good reasons to question growth and see if there's a new way of organizing society that is fruitful, uh, fun to live in, and with less growth. And that conversation is just very, very hard to, to have with economists because it's built into their DNA through the, I think primarily through the career ladder uh, process. So that's really interesting to me. How do you do that? How often do you raise the question? How do you get them engaged in that when they've got a lot of other things they think they should be thinking about? The second example is much more difficult. And that is, uh, and, and this is interesting because John Kelly was in the same meeting with me last night, John Kelly. Uh, and that is, um, how you get people default to wanting to be beat up on the Trump supporters. They are stupid. They are in a bubble. They are uneducated. Now, my view is that while there's some truth to that, uh, we also are somewhat uneducated, somewhat stupid. And there's a certain parity there. And that the argument that they are stupid avoids dealing with the fact that people like us help create the conditions that led to Trump. And we've got to learn to deal with that. Uh, a couple of concrete things that came up in last night. One has to do with uh, voting machines. Uh, Trump is crazy to question the voting machines. Well, I remember back about 10 years ago when people like us were convinced that the voting machines could all be hacked because they had software. So we helped create the environment that Trump uh, uses. There are just so many things that are like that. Uh, take for example, the problem that we face is 11, well, 10 and a half million people more voted for Trump in 2020 than in 2016. That's a very uncomfortable fact for us. Why are they doing that? What's going on there? When people say that uh, Trump is crazy to believe the election was stolen, hey, wait a minute. We all were part of thinking that Bernie Sanders lost out to the Democratic National Committee's machinations. And it, the primary was stolen from Bernie. So the Democrats have a candidate which only exists because the party was stolen. Uh, so it's... Uh, it, the difficulty of getting progressives to get off of beating up on Bernie supporters and avoiding their own causal relationship to creating the conditions that led to Bernie in the first place. So that's a, just a very difficult conversation to have. Uh, it's somewhat about facts, but it's also about the flow of the feelings that connect facts. And I don't know quite what to talk about. I mean, Dow, <laughs> in a way, Dow is implicit in all this. Uh, so uh, anyway, those are, th and I have one further thing on my mind, which is totally different. And that is, I noticed that when most of you uh, talk, when it's your, to do your debriefing, uh, you look at your camera. I find that very difficult for myself for this reason. I'm used to lecturing, and when I lecture, I'm following the body language of the group. 
the little zoom windows break up the bodily body language of the group so it's not a coherent thing. So I find that looking into the group while talking like I am now is painful. So I want it to turn away. Uh, and I wonder if anybody else has any experience at all like that. Anybody? Pete? And then um, for, for me, it's the, the difficult conflict is wanting to look at the little windows because I want to see as much of the eyes and the body language as I can get through Zoom. Uh, but wanting to look at the camera so that it looks to you like I'm looking at you. Uh, and I haven't found a configuration that lets me do both. So now it's kind of a practice to force myself to look at the camera, which also has a ring light behind it. So I'm getting too much light in my eyes when I'm apparently looking at you. So it's, you know, it, it's a fail right now. I don't know what the, I don't know what we do about it. You could just duct tape a selfie stick to your head and just keep, keep that out ahead of you all the time. <clears throat> I could. Yeah. And of course, you know, we're, we're, we're missing not just my body language, we're missing pheromones and all sorts of other stuff that we don't get in, you know, in real life. But this and is what we hugs. have. To and the hugs. Yeah. Hug starvation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Pete Vincent Klaus. Well, one of the things whenever something like this comes up, one of the things that really fascinates me is that um, is how different everybody's cognitive abilities and cognitive deficits kind of um, are. And we think we're all the same and everybody sees pretty much the same thing or you go, okay, well, there's the shy people and the, the boisterous people. And it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. And there's a lot of variance and a lot of, you know, weird things. So I, I, I find it interesting, Doug, that, that it, it's not easy or not pleasant to look at a, a Zoom screen for you. For me, just, just as a, a reaction, um, it actually works pretty well for me. And I get most of, this is gonna sound weird probably, but I get you know, 50% of the body language kind of, of an in-room meeting through, through a Zoom window. You know, so maybe that means when I'm face to face, I'm missing out on a bunch of stuff, or maybe, maybe I've been working with screens and stuff. I have been working with them for, de you know, a couple of decades, kind of you, interacting with things and people and stuff like that on a screen. So I'm really used to it, and I talk screen really well. Um, I have kind of an opposite problem. One of the things, um, it's. One of, one of the things that I do that, that mo would be rude if most people were doing it, and I hope it's not rude when I do it, <laughs> is that um, having, having the camera right here and the Zoom window right here and a, a whole bunch of other windows that I'm working <laughs> on lets me get a lot of bandwidth for bringing information into the meeting, right? And, and I feel like, I don't think this is actually true, but I feel like it's rest, less rude than if I'm doing that, you know, in person. In person, there's a lot more pressure for, I, I, so I'm a, I have a little bit of neurocognitive divergence. Um, so in a room, I'm trying to be polite with other people. I'm trying to act like other people act when you're in, you know, in, in concert with people. I try to be present on, I, I let myself go a little bit and I interact a lot more with, uh, you know, I've got browser windows and, and transcripts and, and emails and chat things going on. And I'm pretty good at synthesizing all of that into a channel, you know, and, and putting it in chat or something like that. Um, but I, I also kind of know that, uh, that, you know, the cheat that I'm doing or the, the, I'm allowing myself to do that. And I, I, I'm sure that I appear distracted to some people that, you know, Pete's multitasking. He's actually not listening when I probably am pretty listening pretty good most of the time. Um, the other thing I've noticed uh, is I, I'm pretty sure I watch myself on chat now and I, I'm smiling less than I think I would in a meeting. Um, I, I, so I go to resting bitch face um, rather than the performative stuff that I would do in person to make it look like I, you know, my, my emotional, you know, uh, communication and stuff like that is like everybody else. You know, I, I, I learned over the course of, you know, my, my life, you know, Hey, smile, you know, look at people when they're talking. And I think all that stuff is really important. And I'm, and, and I, I do some of that naturally um, when I'm face to face with people. I and I've learned that I do some of it performatively. I've learned to perform how to you know to be engaged with people just so other people think I'm engaged. When my normal mode of engagement is probably a lot more the way I look on Zoom, kind of like always distracted and always doing something else, but actually paying fairly close attention to what's going on too. So, 
I resemble that, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Uh, quickly, Vincent Klaus Scott. So I actually wanted to respond to Doug's first point more, which uh, like, so I've read two, I've read this book, Winners Take All recently that talks about this a lot. It's like the whole purpose of the book and also a podcast called Revolution Now, which I'll post a link to. And there were two main threads that I wanted to comment on. So one is uh, our privilege. If we happen to be like lucky enough to be in this call and have the time to actually like talk about these ideas, um, like our privilege in a way insulates us from engaging with the root causes of, of the inequality and the issues like climate change. Um, because like it's, it's, there's a bias where we feel like, uh, oh, we like worked to like get where we are. And therefore other people should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps and like work harder. And it's even if we just got lucky because we were put into a certain life. And some people may have not been put into a great life and then worked hard and got lucky and that paid off and they were here. And so I think there's a, a bias in our privilege where we just think that other people can do what we did um, when it's not really reality. And I think the other thing is there's a bias about if someone is successful in the current system, they make a lot of money, um, I think there's a dogma that companies and and startups are and are the best way to create impact and it's the way to make the most impact on the world and so there's more of a tendency to like make a lot of money and then use the profits to donate to another company to solve a problem where it might be the case that the the the, the system is the cause of the problem and so it's like not seeing the issue with practices that make philanthropy necessary. And so it's like, if, you know, there's like, I see stories about people touting like a little girl for like selling lemonade to pay for cancer treatment. And I'm like, isn't it kind of messed up that we have to do that in the first place? Like, yes, that's great. But we have to think about like, you know, and it's like somebody who is, uh, there was a story in Winners Take All, somebody who had like a cigarette company that made a lot of money selling cigarettes and marketing these cigarettes that were like way worse than other cigarettes. And they were spending the profits to donate to hospitals. And it's like, wouldn't that your effort just be better spent just not selling cigarettes? Like, like you would probably have more of an impact just not doing anything. So yeah, it's hard to see that though. If, if we're privileged and also we've been, the people who are successful from the system don't see what's wrong with it. Yeah. You I just would, opened up like eight cans of good worms. Go ahead, Klaus yeah. and Scott. Yeah, I would also come back to Doug's comments at the first first part of his of his comments, and there is an an, an element that uh, Doug you didn't mention, which is that we really live in an era of information warfare. Uh, I, I mean, information has been weaponized uh, for several decades already. Um, and in all reality, we, we are still in some form of a civil war today. Um, it's just not being uh, fought out in the streets and it's not a shooting war, but it's about information. And <clears throat> that, is, that is designed to influence people's behavior. And the outcome is as impactful as a real war, right? Because uh, it shifts the, the, the direction of our national economy. Uh, when you think about climate change, and when you think about the disinformation campaigns, you know, the delegitimizing de 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 of uh, science or uh, the scientific process. So it's not just that we have to be rational in, in uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I'm a great fan of spiral dynamics and so on, but no, there is an additional element where, where you have to start neutralizing disinformation before then inserting what we think is rational truth. And that is really, I think, the challenge uh, of our time. I totally agree, Klaus. I put a really important link in my brain into the chat, which is that we are already in a nonlinear war. This was, uh, this, the, the light bulb went off for me when I watched Adam Curtis's documentary, Hypernormalization. 
and he's like, hey, look, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And, you know, whether it's election influencing or disinformation or QAnon or whatnot, we are way deep down that thing. And, and uh, it's just an undeclared war. Um, Ken, thank you very much. I will, I will do that. I have to boogie at uh, two minutes of to join a different Zoom. My apologies, but this, this call can keep going until we're done. Um, Scott, then Judy. Um, so the part about Doug's, Doug's wonderfully enthusiastic uh, contributions that stuck with me was the question about the desire to turn away from the screen. And what I'd like to address about that is as fundamentally social creatures, a face is feedback. That's fundamentally what your face is from another person's perspective. It is a feedback, continue what you're doing, don't continue what you're doing. That's a good thing, I like that. Mm, no, I'm dis in disagreement. So feedback includes judgment. And so the intensity of having for 16 on my screen, all looking at me, but small, it's like you're all in the back of the auditorium, you know, and, and because there's no one in front of you, I'm kind of separated in a sense and thinking, you know, like, what are, what are they all up to? And I want to look around because I want that, like, okay, Pete's smiling at me. I'm seeing that, I'm seeing that face. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like keep going, this is good. Or I'm looking at someone else who's, who's over here. They might be focusing, but they're, they're not paying attention. And so those are all feedback mechanisms for me. And the intensity of it, especially as someone who's more introverted of having everyone look at me is, it's a lot. Um, the second part that's kind of somewhat related is it's really hard to take this all in in one and we see motion. I'm always seeing motion. And when you see motion, you don't even think, you just look. You know, your, your activation systems like are built to see things moving. Um, and so all of that combines to be a really intense experience. And so you'll see what I'm talking a lot of times. I'll, well, I think this, and it's because I, I can't take all this information in and make my own thought at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Judy? I just think it's really important that we recall that when we're trying to communicate with people, the first initiative actually has to be inviting them to share and listen. Because if that doesn't happen first, anything else is kind of a lost effort. And in order to do that, I think we need to polish our skills at learning from them their framework so that we can interact effectively with them in their framework to help them see other dimensions that they're not seeing. And this is a, it's an enabling skill, it's a facilitation skill, but people don't sort and take in facts that are inconsistent with their beliefs without there being an opening of some sort. And if there's anything that OGM and the things we're trying to do can do to get at that fundamental dimension of entry and engagement, that would be a tremendous contribution. Musco, thank you for saying that. that. Those are great last words for me to hear on this call. I need to hop off also, so thanks folks. Good to see you. All right, so uh, Judy, if you can hold on for one second. I, I actually sent this to Jerry a while ago. There's a fellow by the name of, um, I think it's, uh, it, Somebody's last name is Clear. He does this, this newsletter called Real Clear Communications. He said, when we're trying to um, work with people who have uh, very uh, hardened boundaries around their thinking, it's really not very effective to engage in conversation with them. But if you can give them a book where they can sit on their own and go, hmm, okay, I can have this dialogue with the, with the author about how it's challenging me. It's much less threatening and they're much more likely to um, come to a different arrangement in their minds. So just one of the things of sometimes conversation is not the best way to change somebody's mind, but to just let them go off and, and study something on their own. Uh, so and I, just, I love that idea, but I would also suggest that attention spans are such that books are not well received by broad masses of people. Yeah. So something need, like a Rome book would be unbelievable. We need to get something that's much more short and succinct that invites engagement somehow, because the percentage of people who don't even have a book in their house is incredibly high. 
But a Sadly Wikipedia true. type structure is phenomenal. All right. So uh, I have. Guys, but it's been great as always. Good mm -hmm. to see you, Judy. So I've been using my little uh, tip that I found out about Zoom where I can arrange windows where I've put everybody who's spoken up top and I now know who exactly who has not gone. So it is George, then me, and then we'll go to John Kelly. Okay, thank you. Um, where to start? Oh, I feel like my mind is just going crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, I have been using Twitter as a kind of market research tool. Um, my background rele rele relevant to some of the things that were said today is that I was the inventor of the telephone focus group. So I, about in 1972 or so. So I've done over 8,000 teleconference focus groups, mostly without video. I've done a few thousand in-face in focus groups. And I can talk a lot about the difference between face-to-face -face and um, audio only and all of that. But what I really want to talk about is the idea that in, in Twitter, what I've, I've tried a whole lot of different things over the last few months, coming up on about a thousand followers, which is not bad, not, not fabulous, but not bad. Um, I'm just seeing that the, the most receptive thing in my area of mind skills, mental effectiveness skills, the thing that's being reacted to the most is something that kind of really took me by surprise. Maybe we'll take you by surprise. Um, I've got a, something, and I think we all have something that I call expert blindness. An expert knows almost everything there is to know about a certain field, except for one thing, what it's like to know nothing. Okay, see a lot of nods. So it takes a lot of training. It's not that you can't see from the beginner's mind it's that it takes a lot of training and work and really hard work. And what I found is I have been constructing models of thinking much like Scott, um, models of thought and emotion and learning and all, all the different kinds of mental events. And it's gotten very complicated, but to my, I am astounded by the fact that if I just give people, I'm, my audience is, is not you kinds of people, uh, older, accomplished, uh, very, very finely honed thinkers. It is a lot of the 20 and 30 somethings that are starting their lives who could benefit from the wisdom of somebody in his seventies who has been very, very successful um, and thinks he knows why. Uh, and thinks he knows what's tra transferable. Instead of a great deal of complexity, what astounds me is that a few simple steps, the Rome people have taken to calling it patterns, but a good example of that is what was mentioned before, the scientific method. If you Google scientific method, you will see six simple steps. We all know that each of those steps could be, in, could be and has been a book, a, a gigantic body of literature. How you do each of those steps is very different in physics versus biology versus all the other sciences and all the things that we debate whether they're sciences or not, like economics, which I don't think is a science. But, um, and psychology, which some people consider to be poetry. Um, but, but the, so if, when I, when, if I come up with six or eight or four simple questions to ask for problem solving, decision making, how to set your goals, how to get clarity on a concept, those kinds of things are being, received astoundingly well on Twitter, which tells me, and I'm just not gonna do anything that people on Twitter want me to do, but it tells me from a market researcher point of view 
that this is what people are receptive to. This is what grabs them. And on the old principle, um, give them what, give, what is it? Uh, promise them what they want, give them what they need. Um, clearly people are receptive to simple steps um, that seem to be to them earth shaking to us. It's like, huh? Isn't that obvious? If you want to solve a problem, isn't it obvious that you need to specify the unknown? Isn't it obvious that you need to know what the goal is? Isn't it? No, it is not obvious. And th that to me is mind blowing. Maybe it's all obvious to you, but it's not, not to me. Um, I'm working on a template for how to do the impossible. Um, my relationship with the impossible is a kind of interesting one. These books behind me, it's a, actually a photograph of books, is about a tenth of my collection. They look very erudite, but they're actually books on, they're part of my, maybe a tenth of my collection of magic books. I do magic, not like most other magicians. I do magic to um, bring people into contact with the impossible. That is to expand their view of what is, what is possible. For instance, like right now. Whoop. <laughs> Um, so what is, what, what is possible? It brings people in, in, into the relate. If, if I can blow your mind enough, when you go back to work, problems will look different. Problems will not be, the world will be full of possibilities instead of impossibilities. So um, I'm working on a simple template. I mean, I can write a hundred step template. That's the easy one. I wanna write the seven step template on how to do the impossible. And I wanna do a 50 more of those templates so that these 20 somethings can go through life and say, ah, okay, that's one of those things. And they, they know to look at it and they'll see seven provocative questions to ask that they wouldn't have thought of asking. Or maybe they'd have thought of asking one or two of them. And I think that'll just dramatically enhance their life. So, well, let me stop there. I could go on, but. Thanks, George. Um, you just reminded me I was at a, a birthday party a few years ago they had a really great musician and he said okay a i'm gonna sh can you hear me magician or ma ma magician music. magician and he says okay i'm gonna tell you guys i'm gonna show you guys how to do this trick and he said now it's important you recognize something just because i show you how to do this trick doesn't mean you're gonna know how to do it yourself exactly and i just that really struck me as you know how often we think, oh, I've seen how that's done. I know it, but you can't replicate it yourself. So that's the difference between conceptual knowledge and embodied knowledge. But um, I uh, have I've had an interesting week. I, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Braver Angels, uh, braverangels.org. It's a group that's attempting to bring um, red and blue. And I hate this these terms, red and blue, but that's what we have. So people who identify as red and blue citizens together in conversations. And I was part of a debate. I wasn't part of, I observed a debate this week, um, which was really eye-opening to see how many people really are entrenched in their positions. Um, I like the format of the debate because it, it really was very respectful. You didn't address the other person directly. You spoke to the chair. You asked, it, the chair was very firm of, if you want to uh, challenge that person, you need to ask them a question. So you can't just say, blah, blah, blah. You've got to say, you know, I'd like to know, Mr. Chair, if you would ask the speaker, how they came to believe that or what their evidence is for it. So it was really interesting. And then mm -hmm. um, earlier this year, I, I ran into Ian Bremer for the first time. He runs something called G Zero Media. He was a speaker at a, an event I went to. Um, 
youngest ever member of the Hoover Institute, really uh, amazing speaker, high energy guy, incredibly smart. And um, if you go to G0, uh, I think it's just G G0.com, I'm not sure, but um, I check in with him periodically to get his take on what's happening in the world. And I saw a video of Trump's foreign policy wins. And I thought, Trump had foreign policy wins? That's, that's a new one for me, right? So um, I, I watched this video and it was really amazing. He actually, and he's, a, he's not a, he, he's pretty fair-minded about, um, you know, treating people with, um, with respect. And so, you know, I'm happy to disagree with Trump and I have on many occasions, but here are some things that he actually did that were, that were real wins. And I think it's important for those of us who want to reach out across uh, the divide to actually be able to say, yeah, I'm aware that Trump actually did some good things. And so that was kind of a personal big step for me of I absorbed some things that, that Trump did well, which goes against the, you know, the past four years of demonizing him. And I really just want to, I'll put the YouTube video in here. It's like eight minutes or something. Um, so if anybody's interested, you can check this guy out. Um, he's, he's pretty interesting to, to watch and listen to. So if you're interested in knowing, you know, that Trump actually did a few things. One of the things he said there was that in some regards, it happened because of the really smart people around him. In some ways it happened because if you're the leader of a nation like the United States, you get lucky. And in some cases he actually had instincts that were right that he was able to act on. So just trying to, to broaden the, uh, the ground on which we can speak with, with other people. I'm going to shut up and move it on to uh, John and then Gil and Mark. Um, you just joined us, so uh, I don't see a, a face there, but uh, you're welcome to check in after, after Gil goes. John? Great. Uh, thank you, Ken, and thank you, everybody who's still here hanging out. Uh, there's a lot of things to pick up on, but I want to talk about Doug's uh, comment about how we think about the, uh, the Trump supporters. And I want to introduce possibly a controversial, possibly morally controversial idea that there are, um, there is a continuum of productive and counterproductive error in our thinking. You know, we've been talking a lot about scientific and rationality and so on and so forth. Uh, a good reference for me on this is this book called Hope for Democracy by uh, John Gestile and uh, Catherine, I think it's Conblock. Um, a lot about citizen initiative review. That's something I'm very interested in, you may not be interested in, but the more interesting stuff is on the, um, the kind of errors that people have in their thinking about all kinds of things, public, public issues, and what kind of social container they are in or they're not in that carries them along and manages them through the air. And one issue that we'd be interested in in this group, it's obviously an OGM issue, is how do you correct the air? It's important, really important issue. Perhaps I'm going to suggest even more important is, is there a container that holds the person and continues to hold them through the process, even though they continue to be in error, in significant error? in their beliefs. And I think it's much better if we have that kind of thing. And I think that things like the citizen initiative review, things like citizen juries, things like the budget game that I worked on for five years in San Jose, all of these things are big improvements, even if, and I saw this live, you know, I saw a Tea Party Trump person and progressive person on the table and they didn't go like this because we were set up to prevent that. Instead, it was like, are you going to put $50,000 on this thing or not? What's your solution to, to, op to opening this library or closing this library? It was very concrete. It was very specific. It was very budget oriented and the clock was running. And people made agreements. People respected each other. They didn't agree in, you know, in the fundamental philosophical sense, but they engaged in a process that included practical agreements, which are possibly a necessary first step to the more profound cognitive, social, and policy agreements. Um, I'm taking care of an economist. He's a, he's a pretty well-known and pretty substantial figure, and he's pretty conservative. 
you're much more conservative than I am about this growth issue, you know. And the way I'm able to introduce a little bit of air in his thinking about growth is by calling, looking back into his background and time that he has spent with indigenous people. And uh, it's a very interesting process because all of his professional training is, you know, the standard standard economic way of thinking. And, uh, but he's had some personal experience in, in terms of personal friendships with indigenous people that, that contradicts that. So it's just, a, it's, it's just an example of a wedge uh, for, for what Doug was talking about in terms of uh, breaking into that growth model and, and getting people to think a little bit more broadly about an economy in which perhaps we took an area of life out of the growth model, either healthcare or food or, you know, healthcare, food and housing, you know, suppose those were, I don't mean that they're all uniform. I don't mean that they're all completely socialized, but I mean, there's a floor at the bottom. You don't fall through that floor. You're, you're welcome to go higher, but you don't fall through that floor. And therefore there's no big anxious conversation about people falling through the floor. What, what else would that open up for us? That's a, that's a great question, I think for the future. All right. I have spoken. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Gil, you're up. Hi, thanks everybody. I am, I am really struck um, by how much I love this community. And I thought it was because of the range of what we cover, but it's really, but it's also the quality and the flavor of this conversation, which is really unique. So thank you all for that. Um, I, I have an unknown number of minutes, so I've got to get to a doctor's appointment with Jane. So let me say a couple of things just by way of reaction. Um, um, you know, Pete said something, con Pete said something contrasting the, the Zoom work we do with the real work. Uh, and in a way, this is the real work. I mean, the, the conversations like this are actually part of the real work. And it raises the, the, the challenge, what Jerry said early on, of how do we actually earn a living doing this? because we earn a living doing that stuff that we call the real work. Anyhow, I'm, I'm interested in that melange. Um, uh, Jerry also said something about contrasting um, religion as dogma with science as inquiry. Uh, but there are schools of religion that are inquiry, not dogma. And you find that in the Jewish tradition and the Muslim tradition, Christian tradition and others. And it's a very, very different approach. And a fundamentalist will look at the Bible and say, this is the revealed word of God, word for word exactly in English from okay. thousands of years ago. Fundamentalists of all flavors will say that, and the hermeneutic folks in, in each of those traditions will say, well, what does this word really mean? And what did it mean then? And what could it mean? And what might you infer or take from this? Very different approaches that is much more, it's not a scientifically structured, but it's, it's the flavor of inquiry uh, that I think all of us value. Um, uh, third reaction then a little bit about what I'm up to. Uh, George said that an expert can't see what it's like to know nothing is a brilliant assertion. I love that. Um, but they also can't see what they're blind to, what they themselves are blind to. So um, different kinds of unknowns, both very fertile and powerful. Um, um, for me briefly, um, uh, Jane and I have been have been navigating the the germ theory versus terrain theory of health for the uh, uh, last bunch of years. We're you know, we're dealing with various health issues, both with Western allopathic medicine treatment and Eastern acupuncture, chi you know, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, and other schools. So we're in that dance all the time. Um, and um, uh, for me, very, very vivid this week is that my Western doc says, here's a procedure that I need to do fairly soon. And my acupuncture says that I would not do that if I were you. So I'm navigating those worlds. Um, the, the, the headline of the health story is that most of the extreme issues are behind us. I've got more time and focus, and I feel like I'm finally getting back in the saddle on the things that I've been focusing on and concerned with. And two that are the top of the stack, um, one is that I've been cooking an idea for years that I keep putting down as unreasonable and unrealistic for me to do. And it keeps coming back and grabbing me by the shoulders and picking me up and saying, you got to do this. And that's to build a family of funds focused on climate turnarounds, um, uh, helping businesses be ready to survive and thrive uh, in the new world of climate crisis that we're moving into. And the distinction against most activity is that the, the big corporates have been doing a lot on this for years. That's been where most of my work has been focused. 
Um, there's enormous action in the startup world, uh, but there's a big gap in the middle market, which is the bulk of companies in this country uh, uh, who are not prepared for this. And there's huge opportunity both to contribute positively and make some money as, uh, as owners of companies rather than advisors of companies. So that's back on track. And uh, yesterday I had my first handshake on a strategic partnership that will make this thing move from an interesting idea in Gil's head to an actual economic reality. So that's exciting and terrifying. And I can say more about that at a future call. And, um, and the other is that, and Ken, Ken knows this, is that I've been um, very concerned with, uh, well, concerned with building something online uh, that builds on a community that I was nurturing early last year, looking at climate and COVID and capitalism. Um, and VUCA or Bania's, uh, um, 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 what Cassio is calling it. Uh, I'm really struck by how much there is of this sort of effort these days. So many communities forming people trying to establish a wor worlds. Um, and for me, it's emerging out of my work with corporate and policy, my systems ecology background, uh, what's been emerging with me after a couple of uh, several intensive years of work with Fernando Flores that has profoundly shifted how I listen and how I listen both to other people and how I listen to myself. So my sense there's something very rich there. I'm trying to give it some shape. I think it includes courses and discourses and community. Uh, um, as I hang out here after a long gap um, um, and explore other things like this that other friends are doing, I'm, you know, I'm in the question of what's, what's the distinctive contribution that's new, that's additive, that's something more than what's already there. Because Lord knows, you know, as someone said earlier in the call, um, we all can spend all of our time Zooming and not doing other stuff. So I'm in that question and also how do I bring a Zooming experience forward that really enriches um, the people and concerns that I care about. Um, and uh, you know, brings, someone talked about the youngsters and the oldsters. Um, and you know, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll say that I've learned a couple of things over the last 50 years of work in this realm. Um, that I want to share in a way that's effective and nurturing um, to people who may be earlier on in the game or in the middle of the game or late in the game. Um, anyway, I'm, I've, I've, I've shifted from clarity to rambling, so that's a signal to me to stop now. <laughs> Thanks, Gil. I, and, uh, I, congratulations. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Scott? So something about the Zoom I'd like to build on just quickly. We were talking about this in another group I was in, and it was the idea that I have been saying variations of the same thing for months. As I, I'm working on this program and I kind of share a little bit, and I get a reaction. And every time I share it, I say something a little different. And it gets me closer to something that means, oh, this is my message. I get that. And what we were debating about was, I'm talking to a computer in a sense. <laughs> and if I go in the living room and I'm by myself, I can just talk because you're not responding. You're responding with your faces, but you're not really actually saying anything. And yet it's fundamentally different. If I was sitting on my couch talking to the air, I would not be articulating and refining my message in the same way. And I thought that there's, it's just so important for me to have a group of people who are willing to let me think out loud over every week because I'm, I'm learning about myself. I'm learning about what I'm building. And, you know, adjacent to that, it, it helps keep the, I want to say keep the lonely away in some way, but, it, but it, it's, it's bigger than that. I can get in my own head and live in my own little world and build these wonderful models and they're, they're perfect and they're, they haven't interacted with reality, which is you. And that's so essential to be able to, to say here and then have you say, good, but what about this? And it just, or even just saying it helps me, uh, helps me refine it. So I think the value of these Zoom calls to me is, 
it's uh it's just your presence which is which is just an odd thing that that changes what i'm saying mm -hmm. and makes it better so thanks scott mark welcome thanks for joining us <laughs> thank you good morning um, i'm joining you from uh the inner sunset of San Francisco. This is my first uh, OGM Zoom call. Oh, um, yay. I can't make it at uh, eight o'clock. Um, I take it it did start at eight o'clock today. And, it did, uh, it did. We're yeah. running late. We usually wrap by 9.30, but i um, glad uh -huh. you were able to make it and see, share what you'd like to share. I'm um, sure. So um, I am a long time uh, uh, researcher in uh, cognitive science and uh, uh, collaboration tools. I know John Kelly, um, and uh, I uh, was just looking in my uh, notes, which I call MX after a mind experiment. And it uh, seems I met Gil Friend on, uh, around, on around May 27th, uh, 2018, uh, hiking, uh, Bobby's hiking to the next level up, and we talked about Stafford Beer. And uh, um, certainly uh, have a cybernetics history background. Uh, the books behind me are one tenth of my books as well. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, um, a lot of their cognitive science uh, to uh, kind of develop a cognitive art. I've been uh, taking uh, uh, notes, building a very closed, very uh, non-global, very local mind. Um, and at the moment, I've got uh, about 2.3 million uh, unique text strings with about uh, 13 million links behind them. I've met wow. Jerry and uh, um, uh, certainly Jerry uh, knows I've been doing this since 1984. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Open Global Mind is, um, but certainly um, I am very passionate about uh, uh, Memex related tools. I work at the Internet Archive. I'm on disability. <laughs> Um, at the moment, um, uh, healing from a uh, uh, cancer that uh, the uh, chemo um, uh, loses the hair, but uh, that's going successfully. And um, I'm not exactly myself at the moment, but uh, I've been poking around uh, engaging in private conversations with uh, people at OGM and attempting to figure out um, uh, what it is, <laughs> but uh, um, I posted uh, in the decentralized web um, uh, thread um, as a member of the Internet Archive. I'm familiar with Wendy Hanamura, and she put uh, she has a uh, well, not she, but uh, the Internet Archive, and she and the decentralized web movement um, have a meetup. It happens to be. Um, uh, Thursday, it starts at 11. I posted the link in the chat. Um, that's all for me right now. Um, just uh, dipping uh, a toe in. Uh, usually on Thursdays, I can't make it, um, uh, which is unfortunate. But uh, next Thursday, I'll attempt to uh, uh, join from the beginning. Well, thanks very much for joining with us, Mark. And I don't know, you may not be your usual self, but self that Self you are seems pretty cool to me. So uh, glad you brought him forth today. And um, are Thanks, you man. on the OGM forum? I am on the OGM forum. Okay, so you, oh, if you yeah. dig through there, you can find uh, some videos Jerry's done about roles and guilds, guilds and things like that. Um, I will not attempt to say what OGM is because although I've been a member from the onset here, I don't really have, have a way of framing it up very neatly. Um, maybe anybody else want to take a, a shot at that? Scott, you got a, you got a way or Vincent? Um, or we'll, we'll just let it pass. It's I, well, it's an evolving thing. It started when Jerry had collected 400,000 thoughts in a software program and then decided that he wouldn't it be cool if I connected those with someone else's. And then it just kind of well, who else would I connect it with? And then we started to collect and we turned into a weekly meeting that we would have just very much like this, which then turned into the more action-oriented people of our group saying, this is fun, but what can we do? What if we actually made some things happen? And then it started to expand in that. And at that point, we 
are trying to determine how we fractionate. And the latest vision is that we have a federation, which is a group of so kind of autonomous but connected entities who are all heading out on quests and trying to make things happen. And we regroup together to share tools and experiences and encouragements and fellowship. And um, there are other calls, Mark. There's a there's a Tuesday call, a steering committee call. Um, so I, I suggest you just connect the jury, find out. Um, or Vincent, you you're doing the the calendar. Um, there's a also... Friday call that I'm aware of um, that uh, Peter Kaminsky um, has. Uh -huh. I forget exactly what it's called. I think it's I... the flotilla call, fl flotilla yeah, Fridays. The flotilla yeah. Call, yeah. Mark should be part of the Metacogs group, I think. Yeah, and also um, Kiko Lab on Mondays. Mondays at um, at noon. So, um, I'm also in, I'm in Center Fell, so we're we're practically neighbors here. But and Gil's over in Berkeley, uh, and John is in Berkeley. Um, so we have and and Doug is up in uh, Duncan's Mills. So there's you have the cadre of of uh, close people here. I'm good um, friends with Jack Park and uh, a number of people who are very, very young, uh, who are building their own Memixes, um, including uh, um, the founder of Rome and the founder of, uh, oh, what is it, Ideaflow. Um, so okay. uh, I've been around the community for, for a good while. And the uh, Internet Archive, of course, is a great connector of uh, folks. So, um, But uh, yeah, Gil mentioned Fernando Flores. And uh, the structure of communication, um, so long as we can keep it human, is absolutely amazing uh, work. And uh, uh, yeah, just uh, hope to uh, continue to uh, meet people and uh, connect and uh, improve uh, our integration. All right. Thank you all for being here. We're going to wrap now. Um, Scott, I'll hang out with you for a few minutes to talk about that other thing that we want to talk about. And um, see as many of you as possible next week. Have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, stay human. Ken, Ken is, the, is the chat saved anywhere? Uh, it will be saved, yes. Okay, and uh, yeah, Jerry, like Jerry puts it up. Okay. Um, I'm going to save it on my computer just to be, uh, let me see, percent. Uh, yeah, I'm going to save the chat on my computer in case it doesn't automatically go with the recording. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Ken, would you do me a favor and send me a copy of that? I will. I'm on my phone. I can't see how to save it from my phone. Okay, sure. Thank you. Scott, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, Doug, I'm, I'm curious. You, you posed that question to the group about does anyone else feel that intensity of, of the faces and, uh, and the people or the, the desire to turn away? And I'm curious after we've had some conversation about that, if you could expand on that feeling for yourself and, and if you've come to any conclusions. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm torn by the need to end the meeting, so I don't want to go uh, yeah. on too much, but it's the kind of question that takes some um, uh, meandering around because it's very experiential. Uh, but I just, it fascinates me how uh, well most of you maintain eye contact uh, in the, your little Zoom window with me, uh, but I'm not so able to do that. And what I find is that, that I can't pull the group together into a single experience of your body language the way I could if we were face to face. And somehow that m makes me want to zoom in on one face or another because I can't do the integration, but I don't want to do that. So I find myself feeling a funny kind of pain and wanting to, to break the contact so I can continue my own thinking. Anyway, I'm not being as coherent as I'd like to, but I'd like to raise the issue of the kind of experience we have in different kinds of groups and to be able to talk about that. So it, it that strikes me I've, as an introvert, I don't mind public speaking, but one of the things that I noticed, and they said in a classroom experience or in a group, you, you talk to one person at a time. And that can, that can really be helpful. 
you move around the room, but you, but you, you talk to one person, then you talk to another person, and you you continue around the room, even though you're on the the stage or at the pedestal or whatever. Um, and I, I I see how that is more difficult to take the rest of the room and make them into one chunk, <laughs> if you will. You know, you have this this you can. Yeah, you're right. It's it's harder to tell because we're all in different backgrounds and different spaces. And it is a it is hard to define, but that helped me get a handle on it. Good, and I'll think more about it too because it's I, th I think it's interesting. Excellent, thanks, Doug. Good. All right, everybody, take care. Bye, John. Bye, John. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Cool.